I'm a terrorist. Okay, don't regret your choice because you can get sleep right now. <laughs> if, if you do not regret your choice, please play the press. But Ken Jennings is better than being asleep. <laughs> I think I'm just going to, um, maybe I'll tell a story or tell a couple stories. But mostly I just wanted to talk to you guys. We'll do a little semi informal, we'll be pretty informal QA. We can talk about whatever you want to talk about. But there's no government here on this boat. There's no command telling you what to do. We're international waters, I think. Probably. We can do whatever. I mean, we're not going to do like human trafficking or whatever, but like, we can have a little fun. Uh, quite a few years ago, over a decade ago now, it's, it's weird. So I was 15 years ago that I was on Jeopardy, which makes me feel very old. But, uh, earlier this year, one of the kids in the, whatever it's called, this National Spelling Bee, uh, put in his bio that uh, the interesting fact about himself was that he was born the day I lost on Jeopardy. Pretty <laughs> 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 good geek. <laughs> uh, it's not about you. I do like the idea that there might be some midnight ch children scenario where, like, a whole generation of superpowered spelling bee nerds were born at the stroke of midnight. Or were conceived? I don't know, I'm just spitballing this right now. Whatever's funny. Uh, like, the exact moment I lost on Jeopardy. Anyway, several years thereafter, I, I did a lot of like TV and media stuff in the wake of that. All set up by Jeffrey to sell the end of good soldier. But a lot of it was fun. You know, I got to read the top ten list on the other end. And I got to, um, me and Grover talked about the importance of fresh fruit on Sesame Street. <laughs> <laughs> if you ever get to meet Grover, he's pretty cool in person. He's just as nice as he appears on TV. <laughs> what is the best fresh fruit? Well, what is the best fresh fruit? Yeah. I know. You went first. Oh, we, we were just telling people to eat more fresh food. Okay. We, we didn't have opinions. <laughs> My answer is pineapples. I don't know what your name is. <laughs> yeah, give it up for pineapples. <laughs> it's going to be dependent in the crowd. Is there going to be here like really fresh mango? <laughs> Alright, let's talk to you guys. Good night, everybody. Uh, I was eventually like played myself on The Simpsons, which was pretty fun. But not everything was exactly as fun. In this case, they had lined me up to be interviewed by a kind of a cable news blowhard. And I don't know, maybe I should protect the identity of this blowhard. International Waters! Why did it be so? I don't know the politics of anybody here, although I have a pretty good idea looking at some of you. <laughs> We're just going to call this guy to protect his identity. We'll call him Ben Black. So I'm on the Ben Black show. And this is actually weird. It's before Ben Black moved on to Fox and became like a, a cult leader slash conspiracy theorist or whatever he briefly was. It's a very odd time. Uh, he was still on CNN, I think, or maybe CNN Headline News. Anyway, he just did kind of a straight interview show where he was one of their straight talking, finger wagging guys. Well, I have to do 10 minutes with Ben Black. And I've done a lot of gay show related interviews, and I kind of knew how they went. And I was very surprised at how Ben just came out of the gate when he had five or 10 minutes to talk to me. The whole interview was like this. Now, Ken, uh, are you a nerd? You're a nerd, right? What's it like to be a nerd? Like, what are some of the nerdy things you are into? Tell me. Tell me what, what the nerdiest thing you've ever done is. Did you get beat up a lot in school for being a nerd? Like, you get shoved in lockers and trash cans, you know, like, you're a nerd, right? Like, this is literally every question in the interview. And I was, like, confused at first when he started off that way. But, you know, as the very long, like, eight to ten minutes or whatever it was, as the segment ticked to a close, I kind of figured out in my head what was going on. Um, when Sorry, ben. <laughs> ben is not, uh, he's a little bit older than me, he comes from a different time, which I also remember kind of dimly. He came from a different America, one in which there were 
essentially two important tribes of people. There were nerds, and there were jocks. Like, not even, this is before there were, like, nerds and fools. There were nerds and jocks. And the way you showed you were a red-blooded American jock was to pick on the nerds. That's just how it worked. And I realized I was seeing something of Ben's high school uh, experience maybe recapitulated here, like, with him just very eager to signal which side of the divide he was on. And I think it was hilarious to me because apparently nobody had told... Uh, Ben, I don't know why I got myself into this. The, the great jock nerd culture war ended pretty decisively about a decade before when the nerds won in a clean It was not even close. Like, we had already taken over the culture, and I don't know who he thought he was talking to, but he was now living in America when there were and full summer blockbuster movies about the Guardians of the Galaxy, you know, like, and even when I was a kid, that would have been a bit much to think that the Guardians of the Galaxy were like, their comic book got canceled all the time, like, I don't think this is going to be a movie. Uh, or that our, um, not going to that stage, like, the idea that somebody could be famous to, like, a million people in America because he was confused by d and <laughs> and I was, I was confused by the idea as a kid, never got me anywhere. He uh, would legitimately become a celebrity by like playing video games or talking while somebody else plays video games. That our captains of industry would no longer be like the kind of mutton chops, uh, large men standing bestride railroad tracks or whatever. You know, if you look at pictures of Cornelius Vanderbilt or whoever it is, you know, our 19th century tycoons. It's a lot of just, you know, oozes toxic masculinity. And, you know, we haven't solved that problem. You know, all our billionaires are still white men. Some of them are awful. But, you know, at least they're kind of sallow, hunched over, <laughs> like, monitor the heat and the bats in, you know, at least. Like, I think that's really, that was really the sea change right there. The internet appeared, and suddenly it was quite clear who was running the culture. And it was not big guys with button shops. It was... It was Gates's and Zuckerberg's and, and, uh, and that changed everything. And of course, I was always who you see before you, you know, a little bit about me. I was always a trivia kid. And when I talk to other trivia kids, people who enjoy knowing things, they're really just enjoying knowing things for fun. Yeah, it seems like a fun thing. That's not something you've ever had to convince that little kid. Like, she or he came out of the box that way, you know? It's the kid that's always carrying around the Guinness Book of World Records and just bugging mom and dad with the facts about how, you know, the size of the biggest pumpkin pie ever baked, or, uh, you know, not just the long fingernails of the two guys on the motorcycles, you know, not just the fingernails, but like uh, just the weird facts. Hey, did you know that the, a polar bear's Skin is actually black, or, you know, fun facts. Jerry Maguire kid type facts. Uh, and that was always me. Just loved, loved to know stuff. Can't even explain it. Must be genetic. You know, you just you come out of the womb a sponge, and you just want to fill it with stuff. You're a good wife's slate of the brain. And you realize, or I realize at least very quickly, because I'm from a different time, that you got to go in the closet with that, maybe. Like, it's, uh, it's not a hit with girls to know Captain Kirk's middle name. Because you know? like, nobody likes the know-it-all, necessarily. Uh, and so for many years, I was like a deeply closeted trivia nerd. You know, I knew a ton of stuff, but I was careful not to be the person with the... Uh, oh, and furthermore, did you know, or the correction, the well, actually... And don't get me wrong, I think these are actually very good social urges, and I encourage you to think about them more deeply in your lives, you know, to take a breath before actually explaining anything to anyone. Because sometimes it's helpful and fun, it advances the conversation. And sometimes, you know, it just takes a little bit of a And you have to kind of develop some, some uh, trivia card for that moment. 
But I was always that kind of kid, and I was the exact wrong generation for that because I was a little bit about me. I was born in 1974. So I was exactly 10 years old in 84, which was not only the year the Real Pursuit came out and sold like 10 million copies and it's on every dining room table in America. Uh, it was also the year Jeopardy came back on TV. So trivia kind of had a moment. And there were, if you remember this, there were a ton of quickie trivia best selling books in, in Walden books and Bee Dolphins. It was kind of the is the game fad at the moment, just like just like it was back down in five years before, and then eventually it would be uh, Pokemon or Texas Hold'em or that thing where you look at the dots and it turns into dolphins. You know, there's always there's always some publishing fad like that. And for about 18 months in the mid 80s, it was trivia, and I was so happy. It was like the world had finally discovered uh, my little niche, my little thing. And furthermore, we were living overseas at the time. I'm from Seattle, but when I was seven years old, my family moved overseas to South Korea. My dad had, uh, was an attorney, and he had gotten a job with a, with a firm in Seoul. He really wanted to live overseas. So he took two years to back off from his firm to, to live in Seoul. And two years stretched into well over a decade. My family ended up living in Asia for 15 years in Korea and Singapore. So I grew up almost entirely overseas. And it was great. I recommend it to everyone. It's just an amazing experience to, um, I mean, the main thing is to see a culture that's legitimately different from you. There's no people bringing it over and saying, hey, we're all, you know, deep down, all cultures are basically the same. Because if you go to Korea in 1982, which looked about like it after the war, you will absolutely realize, no, this culture is legitimately very different from ours. In a lot of the ways they see it in things. But also that it's working just fine and it's like thousands of years older than ours. And that's a very important thing to kind of put into a kid early. That, um, that it's actually like valuable and great that this is not what you're used to. Love everything about it, one exception. Uh, armed Forces Television. There was, there was no English language TV in South Korea in 1982. And unless you spoke Korean, and my Korean name was pretty lousy and it's not much better now. Uh, really, you had to watch what the Army decided you wanted to watch every day. So there was just one channel. Uh, so the Department of Defense was putting on old odd couple of reruns on Friday night, which sometimes it was, and they only had the first season. You would watch <laughs> the first season of the Jack Club and Tony Randall Odd Couple over and over because that's what the DOD had sitting on the show. Uh, we always got stuff late. There was no commercials. Instead of commercials, there were little PSAs, but like very specific to Army life, like don't start your battle dress uniform and. Uh, you know, make sure you use protection when you're out on the town, soldier. And, and all the stuff that was very confusing to a little seven-year-old who had never seen like VD ads in prime time. But by some weird coincidence of, of Pentagon decision making, like what was on every day after school when I got home from the school bus in the afternoon was Jeopardy and Wheel. So me and all my friends had to watch Jeopardy and Wheel at the same time every single day because there was literally nothing else. Um, if you're under 30, like you gotta not take my word for this. There wasn't. There was no streaming, nobody had nobody even had VCRs for two or three more years yet. Like there was no other option. So we were a forced audience of different. And as a result, we were a we were a deeply devoted and enthusiastic fourth grade class of Jeopardy fans. We, you know, at recess the next day, everybody would be talking about oh, that was a very hard daily double. Yeah, but she weighed her too much. She was in her lead. <laughs> Like, we know what happened in final. Like, you're excited wrong. Like, all she had to do was bet us on the day that you know, we were students of the game at, uh, at 10 years old. And it wasn't until much later that, uh, and that's one thing that kind of helped me inch out of the closet a bit, you know, a brief moment of public acceptance for knowing weird stuff. But it was kind of also just finding this, finding a little subculture. I, uh, in college, I happened to walk by a flyer for the university quiz bowl team and was like, oh yeah, quiz things. Like, I think my high school didn't have that. So I went to the audition and started to make friends who like to play Jeopardy like team buzzer games. And uh, I fucking found my people. And it's a great moment, as you probably know, whatever your own little year your thing is. It's a great moment when you suddenly realize before the internet, we didn't have, you thought you were the only one that was in something. And of course, now we've gone too far the other way. Now you can immediately find 10,000 people who are into something weird. And uh, for better or for worse. But it is a nice thing for the, for the little lost sheep. And I started to see friends of mine, 
from that world. You know, it, it was it was very interesting article. It wasn't a glamorous thing. College ball wasn't on TV anymore in the uh, in the mid nineties. So we we would just be driving all night to get to some California university where we would sit in the basement of the liberal arts building in the dead of night with little home homemade buzzer systems and, and play trivia games for answers about the Franco Prussian War and uh, aldehydes and particle physics and but we were into it. We loved it. We started to see people from our world on Asians, on legit Asians. People were winning Ben Stein's money and winning him the seven figures while he wants to be a millionaire. And for some reason, despite a whole lifetime of being an Asian fan, it never occurred to me that you could actually be one of those people. I just I guess I thought they were holograms or <laughs> they would say like, oh maker from Glendale, California. You know, but you wouldn't imagine her showing up at an audition somewhere. It turned out there were auditions. Um, and you could do that. And so the next time I was in LA, my friend and I called Jeopardy and said, hey, are you guys doing our seats this week? And they said no. <laughs> and we were gone. We were so gone that we decided, well, we, we asked, well, what are the next auditions? And they like, oh, you just missed them. They changed it. And so we, we actually drove back home. We were living in Salt Lake City, Utah. We drove back home and then turned around like a day later and drove back down to LA just for the Jeopardy. Audition, which they tell you not to do, by the way. It's, it's very long odds to, uh, to get on Jeopardy. Is anybody here ever, let's, let's try, try it out. Maybe try it out for Jeopardy. Oh, look at that. Like, half a dozen, I'm oh, sorry, a couple dozen people. Anybody been on the show? I know there's a few on there. Who do have? One here? Is that it? I know there's a one. Oh, yes. I think we were like, uh, Sandy, is that right? Three. Three. Oh, there you are, Marty. Three on the cruise. So I've already got two of you. Hi. How's Hi, it going? Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Tell me your name. Sarah. What season? What season? I was on the year before with you. I was in 2003. Season 19. I was in the, in the You Can Only Win Five. She was in the You Can Only Win Five. And how many did you win? I won two. So it doesn't matter. So you can only Just getting on Jeopardy is the hard part. Like, it's fantastic that you've been winning, too. We have a five game winner here. Yeah. So we're the champion in season four, right? Uh, but just getting on the show is the uh, is the miraculous part. Because I have tens of thousands of people coming out every year. And they only have, if you do the math, you know, 200 weeknights a year, two, two new uh, bodies every night. They only 400 people. So, you know, the odds are approaching 100 to 1 or something like that. Um, it's 10 times harder than getting into Harvard or Yale, I think. It's a very elite club. You get it just by appearing on the show. Um, but we didn't know that at the time. My friends and I both tried out, and we passed the audition. And then they say, come call us. We'll call you. You know, you're, you're eligible for a year or maybe a little bit more. And uh, then I forgot all about it, and I was really not prepared. For it to change my life. But the best thing about the whole experience, um, it's fun to be on your favorite TV show. It's, it's, it's fun. You know, it's as fun as you imagine. It's stressful, but it's fun. It's fun to win a crazy amount of money and think, well, what, what do I do now? You know, what's, what's my life now? So that's also a little stressful, but mostly it's fun. It's a good problem to have. Like the ultimate first real problem is, ah, I just want another huge check on Jeopardy. <laughs> But the best thing about it was to just be out of the closet, you know, to be a trivia nerd on like live TV and realize there's no going back in now. You know, <laughs> I can't pretend I'm, I'm actually one of the cool kids, but I just know a lot about uh, comic opera <laughs> or, or whatever, Gilbert and Solomon. Uh, you know, I'm pretty clearly a nerdy ad. You know? <laughs> so, <laughs> that's not going to go. Maybe I heard so many TV shows, that's the fact. And in this room. Uh, like, I was always going to be that guy. I was only 29 years old, so I was only at 30, and I knew what was going to be on my tombstone. You know, it was going to be something about being a trivia nerd. And that was just a nice feeling, to be honest about who you are. Um, and, to, and to be able to do something you're good at. At, at that time, I was a computer programmer. And because it was the... Uh, Turn of the 21st, the turn of the millennium, I guess you would say. When I graduated from college, I was an English major. But 
I was increasingly nervous about my choice. <laughs> Retroactively. Somebody told me, what's the difference between an English major and a large pepperoni pizza? You guys know this joke? At least the pizza can feed a family of four. <laughs> so deeply worried about my ability to pay the rent with my, um, with my love of uh, Victorian literature, you know. Victorian and Edwardian. Just, just, what was I going to do with my knowledge about GKHS? What's going to happen now? And so I went to work for a friend's internet startup because it was the year 2000 and by law everyone got out of the internet startup. We didn't, we didn't know they were all about to fail. You guys know. This is a funny story to you. We had no idea. We thought test.com was going to be cute. And as a result, when I was on Jeopardy, I was in my sixth year of working as a computer programmer for a healthcare staffing company. And they were lovely employers, and I was just miserable because I was not, it turns out, very good computer programmer. Um, what I had been good at, I knew from like before kindergarten. I love game shows. Like, I cried on the first day of kindergarten when I realized, sure, I was going to get to go to school, but I was going to miss Hollywood Square as a match game <laughs> and the feud. And I was just bummed. Um, not just that day, but for the rest of my life. And I wasn't wrong. You know, I, I didn't see Family Feud again for decades. <laughs> and I never had a guidance counselor say, well, if that's what you'd like, you okay, sure, okay, let's try to figure out like, what, what your life should look like. Because, and he's not wrong. Ex There's a very narrow number of people who can say their job is ex Asia contestant. <laughs> and like, Jim Fultower is not on his cruise, and I think that Randy's, uh, the Randy's Crusty Luck guy is dead, so uh, I might be it. Um, but as I think back on that, like, that's something I should have taken more seriously before I sold out at 25 and decided to code for my friend's startup. Is like, what, what do you actually love, Ken? Like, what, what are you passionate about? And what are you, what are you telling me that? Like, I was good at knowing and remembering weird stuff. Like, it really powered me in a way that nothing else did. And I kind of turned my back on it, like, very young. And I now know that was the biggest mistake uh, I made. Like, I don't, you guys all are lovely, successful people, and you're not looking for advice. But please, take your passions seriously. Take your talents seriously. Like, insofar as anything in life should be sacred, it should be that. Like, you have that for a reason, whatever that thing is that you love so much. Um, maybe it's a career, maybe it's not. Maybe it's adjacent to a career. Maybe it's just fun, you know? Maybe you never become the, uh, the lounge singer of your dreams. Maybe you sing in a community choir, or a church choir, or even in the shower, or in the car. And it adds something to your life, because you're smarter than me, and you don't turn your back on that passion. Um, for me, it was knowing stuff, and uh, I think that's important too. That's important for everybody, no matter what you're into. Like, we don't don't deprecate the things that are in your head just because you can now ask Siri or Alexa or Google. Like think that's going to be an increasing mistake we see as uh, as this new millennium advances. And we're seeing it already. Like the fact that facts mean less. The fact that facts don't matter at all if your grandma on Facebook says the opposite fact, you know, or somebody in a presidential debate just says a made up fact. I mean, that's, that's an awful thing. That's sacrilegious to me. Um, because things being true or not matters so much. And more importantly, I think we are, we, we are all the sum of the things that we have learned. You know? We are all the things that we know. It's not just trivia. Like, that's what makes our decisions. That's what makes you act the way you do. It's the things you know. And we're all the sum of that. There's a, um, there was an 18th century English uh, churchman and writer named Samuel Parr. He's very contemporary and a friend of Dr. Johnson, but we don't remember anything about him today. He must not have had a biographer who made him see funny at parties. Um, but Samuel Parr did say one thing that's still in quotation dictionaries today. He said, it's always better to know a thing than not to know it. And if I've lived my life by anything approaching a creed, it is that. <laughs> but it's important to know things, not just because you might be on a game show someday, and win a jackpot in each other. Oh, who knows? Maybe it will happen to three people in this room. Um, but just because it makes your life so much richer to know that uh, there's a crater on Venus named for Laura Eagles Wilder, or, uh, or koala fingerprints are indistinguishable from humans. I mean, that's good stuff. I mean, it's really important if you're looking to, uh, what, to investigate a koala related crime? <laughs> CSI, Canberra, <laughs> 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 <laughs>
I don't even think of crying and then just rain it on a cloth. There's, there's two sides of that, of that equation. But anyway, the facts do matter. And the things in your head are important. And congrats, I think I'm looking at a room full of people who know a lot of weird shit, am I right? Yeah! Congratulations, you have done well. Uh, it's it's going to make you a better and more interesting person, I promise that. And maybe you will win. Maybe you will win uh, millions of dollars on a game show someday because of all that stuff in your head. It's a very validating feeling. And I hope you get that no matter where you get to use that fact. Use the fact. Um, don't explain. Don't actually make it. Use the fact. Thank you so much for listening to me talk a bit. But I also want to do the Q&A. Do people have, well, what do people want to talk about? Jeopardy, not Jeopardy? I don't know. I think there are mics. There's a hand here, for example. There's a mic on each side. So somebody will hand you a mic. Good morning, Ken, and thanks for joining us on this cruise. Um, I, if you could, can you share the story of how you came to be on uh, the cruise? This, this oh, how I'm, why I'm on the cruise? Yeah. Um, let's see. So it's a little complicated. I'm trying to remember the order. So I'm from Seattle, which means there's a, there's a, there's a pretty good little Joko ghetto in Seattle um, between... John Roderick is kind of the nexus of it. I think, he, I think he's kind of proud of how many, uh, like, how big his Amway downline is. Uh, <laughs> I, think, I think Riz is on the cruise because of him. Um, I, was, I met John at Bumbershoot, Seattle Music and Arts Festival. Uh, I don't know. Well, how long ago? Between five and ten years ago. A long time ago. We met at uh, Maria Semple's house. If you know Maria Semple, she's a novelist. You know, where'd you go for her dad? She was friends with Hodgman. And, so Hodgman, I guess, is kind of the nexus of all realities. Uh, Roderick and Hodgman were good friends. So uh, John and Roderick tagged along. We became friends. Um, if you know John, he's got a very like impressive affect. At first. He's a nerd pretending to be a cool kid. Please don't tell him I said that. I hope he's not here. <laughs> and I immediately thought, you know, I should wrangle this guy into doing something. I was doing a, a video, a promotional video for one of my books, and I, I really wanted John Roderick to be a fake academic. Like I wanted to see him with a clipboard and a uh, like a white lab coat. And I, you know, I'd only met him though once at this brunch. But when I reached out and said, "Hey, do you want to come play a fake academic for nothing?" And he was like, "Sure, let's do it." And I was really impressed by that. So for years we talked about doing a podcast, and then we finally started doing our podcast, Omnibus, uh, which we have a lot of fun doing Omnibus. So now we hang out once a week and get kind of sick of each other, because we do like four shows in a sitting. Like Jeffrey does five, so four Omnibuses is nothing. I can could, I could do that in my sleep. And through John, I, I met Jonathan Colton, also at a Maria Semple brunch, I think. And John explained the cruise to me, which was bizarre. <laughs> Wait, he did the songs for Portal? He's kind of a novelty acapella guy, but now he has a cruise? <laughs> like, I, like, I could not connect the dots at all. But it seemed like it wasn't a prank. Like, it seemed like people were talking about that. <laughs> And then Paul and Storm were coming through town, and I met them. And John was like, hey, if you're nice to these guys, you might be on the cruise someday. <laughs> and I was like, really? He's like, yeah, yeah. You, I, I, come to dinner with us. Like, it was like 2 a.m. We showed up. I showed up at a diner. He was like, just get some FaceTime with these guys. Maybe you'll be on the cruise someday. So John Roderick, the baby had a five-year plan to get me here. <laughs> and I met, I met them again at something else, and then I met them at Sketchfest. And then I got an email, like, nine months ago saying, hey. And I think I was a little bit thirsty. Like, I think at some point somebody said to John, hey, you did whatever your podcast was. You know, he does, like, four shows. You had done a podcast on the work. I can't believe why I'm missing that one for a That was too long to answer, sorry. Some hands over here in the front. I don't know where the mic's going. Do you oh. regret the fame? Maybe you should be taking. Oh, I'm your fist. Do I regret the fame? Yes. Um, the fame's not my favorite part because. I mean, I feel like I never signed the, the, the deal with Satan, you know. The standard rich and famous contract, I guess, the, the, as uh, the Muppet Show would say. Um, when you're winning on a game show, you don't think you're going to be famous. I didn't think I was going to be famous. Like, 
I mean, I was making, I was doing Jeopardy for months and months at a time. So there were, by the, by the time my first show aired, I knew that I was already on 40 or 50 Jeopardies in the can, and I was still flying down to LA to make more, which was awkward. People would show up to play Jeopardy, and they would see me, the, the guy who they had seen in their hotel rooms the night before. <laughs> And honestly, that's a rational way to act when you meet me. That's, that's <laughs> I'm used to that. But, um, you know, as a result, it just kind of grew gradually. Like, every, I just kept winning through a, a weird combination of, 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 uh, of breaks, mostly. And I was never like, all right, this is it. I'm ready to be a slightly famous uh, game show contestant. Uh, there was actually a, a quiz ball friend of mine showed up to play one of those days, and they, they wouldn't let him play because he knew me. Like they're very careful on quiz shows to avoid any appearance of collusion or unfairness. Contestants are sequestered together like a jury. Even my Jeopardy contestants here know this. Trooped around like a chain gang. Like if one person has to go to the bathroom, everybody gets trooped back for a potty break. You're kept strictly apart from anybody on the show who might know the answers. And it's because of all the scandals of the 50s where you know, people had to testify in Congress um, about game show rigging. Like, it's FCC regulation. If you um, if you were to rig a game show today, there's jail time involved. So, as a result of that, this guy didn't get to play. But one of the things he said, I was telling him a story about taping some show, and he said, well, you should save that for Tonight Show. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, we should tell that story on The Tonight Show. I was like, look, I'm not going to be on The Tonight Show. I'm on Jeopardy. I've been watching Jeopardy for 20 years. Let me tell you something about Jeopardy. Nobody cares who won on Jeopardy. <laughs> they watch Jeopardy, but nobody remembers. Because this was, again, the very beginning of the, of the you can play till you lose thing. And we hadn't really recalibrated. Plus, there was no social media. Yeah. Like, today, you got Jeopardy people wanting to go viral. And speaking of thirsty, so eager to go viral with a funny answer or a funny little head shake or whatever. Um, that, that all didn't exist. But um, the thing about being famous for being on a game show is there's really no downside. You know, it's not like I'm so I'm not one part of the culture war. You know, I'm not a Kardashian. I'm not OJ. There's no reason to hate me, really, <laughs> unless you're like unless you're Brad Rutter's mom who kind of hates me. <laughs> I met her twice, and she was very nice the second time. <laughs> um, so basically, because people have good feelings about Jeopardy. Like, people grew up watching it. It's this weird multi-generational show where it's not a cultural niche. Like, people watch it together. It reminds people of their nana. You know, it reminds people of their, their daughter who still calls home from college to play Jeopardy against dad, like she used to when she was little. I mean, it's a really beautiful thing that we don't have in American culture anymore since everything fragmented. So the, the real answer is that usually people are, like, happy to see me, and I remind them of something... They love. And that's a real honor for me to be to kind of be uh, drafting on Jeopardy like that. I don't know where the mic is now. Way in the back, Ken. How old do you think Johnny Gilbert is? <laughs> Johnny Gilbert, the announcer of Jeopardy. Johnny Gilbert, the announcer, I think has a picture in his basement that is, looks old and horrible. <laughs> He's been announcing game shows since. I think the 60s, 60s maybe. Absolutely. Um, and he still it, it is every day on Jeopardy the one who says, uh, you know, uh, an, uh, an analyst from Alexandria, Virginia, and then here is the host of Jeopardy. Uh, he's done it every night. To, I believe I know the answer to this. He is 95 years old, I think. He lives on a boat. He still comes in every day with the same kind of very nice red satin Jeopardy jacket that looks like it was maybe from a crew party 25 years ago. Um, beautiful head of hair that he has, he has put on his head that morning. Uh, he now, here's a little, this is very recent, this is only a couple of years, he only comes for the afternoon shows, again, because he is 95 years old. He comes in at lunch, re-records the uh, top of show announcements for the first three games, because Jeopardy takes five a day. And then after lunch, he calls the two afternoon games. But he is 95 and still going strong, and I love Johnny so much. Um, Alex is almost 80, I think. I think he's 79. They just announced, I think, two days ago that they are not having in live studio audiences for the rest of the season. Um, because, well, again, Johnny is 95. Yeah. Alex is 79 and immunosuppressed because he's on chemotherapy for the pancreatic cancer. 
Um, and really, you know, our number one duty as a nation is to protect Alex Trebek. <laughs> We must not hurt Alex or through inaction allow Alex to come to our first law of jeopardy. And so they're they're keeping out the coronavirus um, in Culver City. Hey, uh, I was so excited to hear that you were going to be on the cruise, and my husband did not know that uh, I was a big Ken Jennings fan. And I guess that we didn't meet till 2008. So. So you got a secret uh, in your I had a secret. A dark secret in your past. I was, very, I was very excited about you and Amy Mann. <laughs> so, uh, I was also excited to see you. Yes, I bet, I bet you were. Uh, so uh, have you, um, or are you, on the short or long list to be the host of Jeopardy? And if you were, would you consider it? So you so you'd be an idiot not to consider it. Uh, so Jeopardy tapes again five shows in a day, uh, which is great. You know, as soon as one show ends, you you and Alex put on a different outfit, separate dressing rooms, of course. Uh, and then less than ten minutes later, you're back on stage, and Alex says, "Now on yesterday's program, and it wasn't yesterday. It was like ten minutes ago. Alex has been lying to you for your whole life." <laughs> But the flip side of that is because they can do five a day, if they only need new tw twenty, if they only need like twenty Jeopardies a month, Alex works four days a month. Yeah. And he makes bank for working four days a month. <laughs> you cannot beat that guy's hourly rate. He is the franchise. Um, so nobody, I think, is gonna turn that job down. But also I think there's a lot of people who want that job. And let me be very clear, that is Alex Trebek's job. I cannot imagine anybody but him hosting that show. So when I get asked anything like this, I get very uncomfortable because it forces me for a moment to live in a world where Alex is not hosting Jeopardy and I am not emotionally prepared for that. Let's hope, let's hope it never comes to that, man. <laughs> yeah, so Alex. The legend. Hi. Uh, I hope you'll talk to us more about Alex, but my question is with James Holtzauer kind of really changing the approach to playing Jeopardy and um, but failing in the end against the greatest yeah. of all time. I think he did change. Thank you, he did not fail. He did change the game for sure. Yes, he did. He changed the game and I'm wondering if there's ever any conversation about the entertainment value of different approaches if the show cares that he changed the game. It, does, does it matter to them which strategy people take? Yeah, there is a tension. Um, if you read Hardcore Jeopardy fan groups online, they, which I don't, that'd be weird. <laughs> they 100% see it as a service that Sony is providing to get nerds on TV. Like, I, I think they don't even know it's televised, maybe. Like, they are just interested in the show as a, uh, as a game. And that's not... I mean, I, to me, that's the right way to treat the game. When I see sports writers write about Jeopardy, they understand the strategy and, the, and the, the gaming aspects of it, which is really what it is. And when TV writers write about Jeopardy, they treat it as an entertainment show. And I know that's what it is, and that's not how you write about it, because that's not what it is. That it's The core of it is the game. So Jeopardy will say things like, hey, maybe you should take the uh, categories in order. Like, that, that's, a, that's a way to play, because it lets you dip your toe in and understand the material before you get to the higher dollar amounts where there's really more cash on the line. And they're not wrong, but they also know that they have a change-averse audience of uh, lovely, lovely senior citizens who do not like when somebody plays the game differently or confusingly. And maybe there's strategic reasons to play the game differently. Um, James tended to start from the bottom up, which is just a genius thing I've never seen before. You know, I've seen people hunt for daily doubles. Daily doubles are the crux of the game and they're underappreciated. It's a chance, Final Jeopardy, too many people leave the game to Final Jeopardy. Final Jeopardy A is much harder. Final Jeopardy conversion is around 47% this year, whereas Daily Double conversion is like in the 70s. So the questions are much easier, the clues, sorry. The clues are much easier. See, I'm never gonna replace Alex, and I keep saying questions and answers instead of clues and responses. Uh, and also, you're the only one playing. On Final Jeopardy, everybody gets a crack at the ball. Like, why would you not want this free throw, this extra point, where it's just you? 
So the game often hinges on the Daily Doubles. And James figured out not only to bet big on the Daily Doubles, because he's a professional gambler, but to start at the bottom of the board and rack up a ton of money. And here's why you want to do that. Because you're the returning champion, and every day they are bringing two new people off the street that are just scared shitless. <laughs> <laughs> like, the longer you're here, it's, it's, very, it's a stressful experience. It is not like the game at home. Like, you feel like the questions are coming at you like artillery. The clues. And, but every day you're there, you get a little more accustomed to it. Um, day two, easier than day one, right? Yeah, and day three, because it was a Monday. Oh uh, yeah, day three's a Monday, so you've lost it all overnight, yeah. right? Yeah. Day five, easier than day four, I'm sure. Um, and the longer you're here, the more of an advantage you have, and yet every day, fresh meat right off the truck. Uh, it's not super fair. And so James's idea was, while those people are still figuring out what's going on, huh. like, vacuum up all the money on the board, find a daily double, double up. By the time you go to commercial, you're up uh, 8,000 to zero to zero, and they have just mentally checked out of the game. Uh, and it turned out to be very smart. Shock and awe, Jeff. I've never seen it. <laughs> the show officially has to be, what, agnostic about gameplay. They can't favor any contestant. They can't favor any style of play. Technically, it's harder when contestants jump around uh, because the camera has to find the right clue. It increases the risk that Alex will read the wrong clue. Um, nobody can go on autopilot when somebody's jumping around the board. I don't think they mind the big wagers, though. That's really good TV. You know, like, people, some people love James, some people didn't like James, but they were all watching because he was going to win $120,000 and risk some insane amount of money. Anything could happen. Hi, so you've talked about what got you to agree to come on the cruise in the first place, but you haven't talked about the last couple weeks before the cruise and deciding to actually be here. My mom, the microbiologist, was really concerned about me coming on this boat, and I said, well, Ken Jennings knows a lot about a lot. <laughs> if I get there and he's not on the boat, well then maybe I didn't make the right choice. But you're here, so how did that It's true. Out? If something terrible happens, you're going to be like, I should have listened to Will Whedon! <laughs> <laughs> I knew he would be smarter than Ken. What was I thinking? <laughs> Uh, yeah, the calculus to go on, the, on a cruise right now is interesting, and I'm sure you've all faced it. I am, let me be very clear. I'm not a virologist. I'm not an epidemiologist. I was on a game show. <laughs> Please do not listen to anything I have to say on this topic. <laughs> but, uh, in my case, the math was made a lot easier by the fact that we flew out from Seattle, where... <laughs> We were not guaranteed to avoid uh, illness anyway. Did you bring it with you? I had, that's, that's the main question. Ken, are you patient zero? <laughs> no, I think John Roderick is. <laughs> <laughs> I've been kind of self-quarantining for about a week, and that's not long enough. Like, I know so you can be asymptomatic for up to two, um, and I was a little worried about that, but I did my best, and I'm not shaking anybody's hand. Uh, I'm watching John Ryder hug people, and I'm like, I know you're a hugger, but I think I know where to look if things go south. Hi. Uh, two short ones. How do you, do you ever use all this uh, trivia that you know? Does it ever come in useful for things? And where's the goat? Second question was? Where's the goat? Where's the goat? Your statue. Oh, I think, do, you think, do you think they gave me an actual goat? <laughs> <laughs> I did have a kind of an acquaintance write to me and say that uh, his sister had just donated a goat to a, a, a village of Syrian refugees in Jordan. You know, this thing where you can, yeah. get, you can get a goat or a, a, you, know, you can give livestock to a village. Uh, and they had named, they were allowed to name the goat and they named the goat Ken Jennings. <laughs> 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 There is a trophy which I didn't bring because it's kind of fragile, but when they handed it to me, they said, don't hold that over your head. <laughs> like, they were legitimately afraid that the base would fall off and hit me on the head. <laughs> Do you ever use it? I mean, you use it on Jeopardy sometimes. Um, but honestly, I think people discount 
the social value of knowing stuff. Like you meet somebody for the first time and they tell you what it is they do or what city they are from or what university they went to. You know, they, they tell you something about themselves. And if you know something, you have a follow-up and you have a conversation. And if you don't, you don't have time to Google. I mean, there are a lot of answers in life that can be Googled. But if somebody says they're from Chicago and you're like, uh, uh, oh, hey, Billy Zane is from Chicago. I mean, that's not an iceberg, you know, like, there's so many things in life that go better when you, because it's an amazing feeling when two people know a thing in common. It, it creates this illusion that you already know each other. There's this weird shared bond that gets created. And that suddenly a first date or a business lunch or a job interview or, you know, whatever it is can suddenly go really well. Here's a, here's a quick story to that point. I was flying back from Jeopardy one time. Uh, sitting next, I, was in, I think I was on Southwest, sitting next to a guy, and he says, hey, what are you doing? What are we doing in L.A.? Going home yet? Yeah. What are you doing in LA? And I'm not allowed to tell because I've signed an NDA saying I can't tell where I've been. My, my uh, boss knew because I didn't want to get fired. And my wife knew because I didn't want to divorce me. But nobody else knew. My parents didn't know. My co workers didn't know. Like, nobody knew why I was going down to LA twice a month. And if you think computer programmers are smart, nobody ever even asked. Nobody ever <laughs> asked. Uh, so I just said, oh, I was on business. And he was like, all right, I'm going to Park City on business. What do you do? I sell wine. I don't drink. I don't know anything about wine or oaky notes or floral or fruity notes or whatever wine has. I, I kind of felt like it was a conversational dead end. And then he said, yeah, I work for uh, Francis Coppola's winer. I'm not a wine nerd, but I'm a huge Godfather nerd. And I was very excited to hear what it's like to work uh, for Francis Coppola's winery. Do you know Francis? Do you know the family? Like, what's he working on? Is Sophia ever there? What's she working on? Isn't Nick Cage related to them somehow? Is he ever hanging out? What's the deal with that guy? Uh, so I had all these questions. And he, he looked at me for a second. And he was like, if you're such a fan of Francis Coppola, tell me this. And I realized what's going to happen. There's going to be a quiz show right here. <laughs> Southwest uh, economy class. And if I know the answer to this Francis Coppola trivia question, I'm going to be like, I'm a cool inside guy, and I'm going to get the connection, and I'm going to get the scoop. And if I get it wrong, I'm going to be reading the Southwest in-flight magazine. <laughs> and luckily, it was something I heard before. He said, what did Francis win his first Oscar for? And it's a little bit of a trick question. Does anybody feel confident about this? Francis Coppola's first Oscar? What category? It is screenwriting, yeah. Do you know the movie? <laughs> he, uh, he has a screenplay credit on Patton. And uh, so I said, uh, the screenplay in 1970, Patton. And he was like, ah, and it was like, very good, Grasshopper. You, know? <laughs> you passed the first test. So don't forget the social utility of the stuff in your head. Like, that's mostly what it's for. It's great to know things, but that lets you know a lot of cool people. So on a scale of 1 to 10, and I'm, I'm sorry if you get asked this a million times, how do you feel about the Weird Al song, I Lost on Jeopardy? <laughs> <laughs> love Weird Al, met him several times, and just a lovely man. Has he ever done the cruise? No, right? No. Lovely, lovely guy. Like, exactly as nice as you would hope. Uh, the thing about I Lost on Jeopardy is once you lose on Jeopardy, they play it for you everywhere. Like, <laughs> well, a certain kind of radio station will think it's funny to play the Jeopardy theme. Oh, what's that music? And that's, that's a theme that always kind of stresses me out now. I can't watch Jeopardy like I used to. Like, when I hear that music, or even if I hear Alex's voice, I really just tense up almost involuntarily. It's like, back in Nam, you know? <laughs> but uh, a certain kind of funny drive time DJ will put on I Lost on Jeopardy. And, you know, at least that's Weird Al. At least I don't associate it with like the most terror-stricken 30 seconds of my life, which is true of the Jeopardy theme, and every pitching change of baseball, when I hear it, I'm like... Hey. <laughs> um, was it tricky for you to transition from having 
the breadth of knowledge necessary from trivia to the depth of knowledge to research and write a book? Well, that's a good question. Yeah, I'm a full-time writer now. Like, I guess when I talked about like abandoning my passion for writing before I even graduated from college, I guess the nice ending of that story is my day job now is I'm a writer, full-time. And people ask me, how do you, please don't applaud, because people will ask me, like, well, how do you, how do you become a writer, Ken? And I don't know. Win 75 times on Jeopardy if you can arrange to, right? I don't know. Um, but, what's that? Why no signing? Why no signing? Why no signing? Oh, your book. Oh, why didn't I bring books? Uh, it seems like a hassle. There's a, 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 I'm happy to sign whatever you got. Grab me afterward. Um, I'll sign whatever you want. I just didn't want to like, arrange a box of books. Seems a bit, like, I'm a Gen X 80s kid. That seems like I care. <laughs> so cool. You're right, it's a very different set of muscles. But I mean, the thing about Jeopardy knowledge is, as you say correctly, it is, it's got to be like miles wide, but it can be a millimeter deep. Jeopardy only works if the people answer the uh, respond correctly to the clues, you know? Like, if, if that doesn't happen, if people just kind of sit there blankly and look at Alex, it's really bad TV. So Jeopardy doesn't trick you. All the clues are designed to lead you to the right answers. And as a result, knowing a, a tiny bit about any subject is usually enough to get two or three of the categories. You don't have to love ballet to get a ballet question of a clue on Jeopardy. You just have to, you know, kind of figure out where the clue is leading you. It was written by a human, and that human is trying to help you. Um, but the thing about me is, like, I'm kind of interested in actually everything. I'm just a millimeter deep because, like, there's too many things and there's not enough hours in the day. So the nice thing about being a writer is if I do kind of get weirdly into something, like, I was a geography nerd my whole life, so I wrote a book about maps. I, I just went crazy about maps. So I wrote a book about weird geo subcultures. Uh, I kind of, I've been a like, kind of comedy geek my whole life, and that was really intensified by watching um, comedy kind of take over media and politics and social media and advertising. And so I, I got to spend a couple of years researching that and write a book. So the depth is actually a joy. Like, my, my number one thing that I believe about nonfiction writing is you need to go through boring and come out the other side. Like, overload people with so much stuff that you think it would be boring, but keep shoveling it on. And like, that, the degree of detail you're giving them will open like a window into like a new world. And you will have, I guess what you've done is you've converted them, the reader, into a boring person. And then the subject just seems fascinating. We have time for maybe one more? One or two, if I'm quick? Hi. Um, I'm going to be the asshole that says this is more of a comment rather than a question. Next question! <laughs> but I remember watching you in your first book on Jeopardy, and I thought I, I totally met my soulmate because you did something that I do in my life and I still do and I drive waiters and waitresses crazy with, which is I round. And when you have, whenever you made a bet, <laughs> you always made bets so that if you won, it would be a nice round number. And to this day, I mean, there are waiters and waitresses all over the country that hate me because I will take the tip and I will make sure that it rounds up to a round figure. And I always think of what I do have. <laughs> I don't think it's just us, because listen to the applause. I don't want to diagnose anyone in this room with any kind of uh, compulsive disorder, but is, is anybody like me? Do you guys round up tips? <laughs> There's no other auditorium in America where you would get half the hand. Yes. Round off to a round number, round off to a funny number. Jeopardy, by the way, will no longer let you wager to wager or wager to uh, $69. <laughs> or like whatever the alt right number is. Uh, there's some skinhead number, you can't do that one either. 420 is still a bit. <laughs> last or last ish question? Yes. Um, what is the Airspeed velocity, but one day. <laughs> Did he even say it was waiting on land? I don't think he said it was waiting on land. We still have time, amazingly. All right, this might be a great question. So you mentioned meeting famous people, and on the show we always, it looks like you're good friends with Brad, it looks like you're good friends with a bunch of the other contestants. Maybe not James, not sure. Um, I'm curious, which of the contestants you actually are friends with? I know not Alex or anything like that. Uh, 
James is actually great. We uh, we had him over for dinner. My wife could attest this. We had him over for dinner a week ago Sunday. Um, he and his family are delightful. He is comes from the world of professional gambling, so he puts on kind of a, a game face. He has a persona, and he crucially he loves pro wrestling. So he likes getting on Twitter and talking smack. If you watch the, the Go Tournament, you've seen it live. Um, which is very fun for me, because Jeopardy players don't normally do that. There's a lot of there's decorum on that show, and I'm not against that. But it was fun to uh, it was fun to, to see somebody doing a little kind of macho man, ooh yeah, uh, on Jeopardy, because you don't normally get it. I mean, the thing about Jeopardy is it's a zero-sum game. The contestants are all kept in a group all day. And you know that the better they do, the worse you do. But the fact that you've been hanging out all day and the kind of the contested people keeping it light means you kind of feel like you're in like a, a fun club. Uh, and it's, it's true. It is a very exclusive, cool club to have gotten the chance to be on Jeopardy. And if you're ever on the show, the number one advice I would give you is just to like have fun with that. Um, the night before the go turn, I was really stressed about it. I did, had not wanted to come back. I thought I was a little bit past my prime. You know, in your 40s, you kind of have this flowers for Algernon experience every day. <laughs> <laughs> just feeling a little dumber every single day. And I was like, no, I'm too old. I'm not going to do it. And they were like, we kind of need three people. We would really like you to do this. We've already signed the thing with ABC. <laughs> so I went back, but I was really stressed about it. And the night before, I kind of had this realization that this is almost certainly win or lose, Ken, the last time you will ever play. Jeopardy. And it's almost certainly, certainly the last time you will be there with Alex. And you have so many good memories here. You know, it's so much fun. It's so much fun, you guys, to play that game. Uh, just have a good time. Like, enjoy every second you're behind that podium. That was like all I was thinking when I was there. It was not just like, what's the outcome going to be? Like, I kind of turned into a Zen Buddhist that moment because I just like let go of the outcomes and just thought, I'm going to really have fun back here. And it is such a fun day. If you're ever on the show, I know some of you have tried out, keep trying out. I think James tried out eight times before he got the call to be on the show. You know, Stay in the pool. It's fun to hang out with the contestants. Yes, me and Brad and James all got along. Great. It's rare to, to be able to play Jeopardy with people who are like not scared and can goof around a bit, so that was fun. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it's just an amazing time, and the more you enjoy it, you'll have great memories, and I think you'll play better. I think you'll win. And when Alex asks you, you know, how are you so dominant on Jeopardy, you can say, well, one time I went on the Joko cruise with 10 kids. Thanks a lot, everybody. It was fun. <laughs>